thank you very much for showing up in your numbers to continue the discussion around pharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals access and other dimensions of the topic. The session is entitled Future Farmer, and it is about opportunities for the localization of modern manufacturing technologies to support the regional production of essential medicines. And I think the conversation that we had in the plenary really set the stage very, very nicely about the need for ourselves to be able to make pharmaceuticals upon demand for ourselves. To be having this particular conversation, I'm joined by a very esteemed panel. And uh, again, the bios that one receives are particularly long, and I may not be able to say all the good things that you all have done. I want to start by introducing Professor Darren Riley, who studied chemistry at WITS, Professor Riley, studied chemistry at the University of Witwatersrand, Department of Chemistry, under Prof. Joe Michael and Charles DeCorny, where his doctoral degree focused on the synthesis of plant and amphibian alkaloids. Thereafter, he was employed as a postdoctoral research fellow under Professor Helda Marquis, during which time his research evolved, involved the synthesis of macrocyclic ring systems in the form of porphyrins for use as biomarkers, focusing on neglected African diseases. And I think that's where I want to end your esteemed profile, Darren, and you can highlight some more about yourself as you introduce yourself further and talk about your work, which would be the, um, the first part. The second person that I will introduce is um, Dr. Vuisile Pehani. Vuisile completed his doctoral degree at the University of Cape Town in the Department of Chemical Pathology and studied, and studied the inhibition of malarial purine salvage enzymes and has developed skills in molecular biology, biochemistry, enzymology, genomics, proteomics, chemical synthesis and analysis, rational drug design, protein purification, protein structure function relationships. He's worked at SA Bioproducts, he's worked in the biocatalysis uh, group at the CSIR at the time, and he rose through the ranks to now be the bioeconomy executive at our technology innovation agency. Thank you very much, Vui, uh, for honoring us with your presence. I want to introduce Prof. Watts. And uh, Prof. Watts graduated from the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom in 1995 with the first class BSc honors degree in chemistry. He continued his studies in Bristol and subsequently worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hull where he pioneered organic synthesis in microreactors. And I think that's a very important topic for the conversation of synthesis at scale and synthesis in continuous flow and so on and so forth. In 2002, he was appointed a lecturer at the University of Howe, being fast tracked to full professor in August 2011, at just the age of 37. And he actually now moved to Nelson Mandela University where he holds the distinguished position of the Sachi Chair in Microfluidic Biochemical Processing in his B1 rating from the National Research Foundation, having published 130 highly cited papers. So thank you very much for honoring our invitation. Now, I'm sitting here thinking I'm missing two bios, Jenny. <laughs> and I'm the first bio is Jenny Lee's bio. I don't know how this happened, but this is where I find myself which is a bit of a quandary. So Jenny Lee, kindly go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm victimizing my colleague, Jenny. <laughs> okay, so it's the... Okay, perfect. Um, so thanks, Rachel, <laughs> for putting me on the spot, but it's fine. Um, I, I have a PhD um, from the University of the Vatastrans, where I did a combined um, degree in synthetic chemistry and microbiology. Um, I then moved on as um, to work at the Medical Research Council for a few years, came, then came to CSR as part of their, post uh, their regional development program. And I've moved through the ranks, I suppose, <laughs> to first um, lead the um, research group that focused on bioassays and high frequent screening, where we did a lot of antimalarial work to identify new um, pharmacophores that can be developed as, as antimalarial drugs. And more recently, through our CSR sign-up strategy, I've now taken over um, a group called Pharmaceutical Technologies, where we are very focused on supporting the local development of active pharmaceutical ingredients. And I see my colleague in the audience here, Dr. Pebble Takoa, who is co-leading um, Future Pharma, which we will be chatting about in a little bit more detail later today. 
what you did not say is that you are my strategy, secret weapon, when we we're talking about our chemicals cluster strategy, I think Jenny played a pivotal role and I think contributed significantly to the content of our, of our chemicals ACP cluster. So thank you very much, Jenny. And I will not embarrass you by not introducing, um, you know, Dr. Skumbuzo. Skumbuzo Goswana is the CEO of Kiara Health, a partner of the CSIR in many regards. A South African-based, Kiara Health is a South African-based, Africa-focused healthcare company. Uh, Skumbuzo is an international expert on the African pharmaceutical industry and has worked in both the private and global public health organizations. He consulted to the World Health Organization, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, and the United States Pharmacopoeia Convention. He co-authored pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa, which is a plan of the African Union. The plan was the output of extensive research and analytical work he conducted on the African pharmaceutical industry. He also co-authored the Ethiopian pharmaceutical sector strategy and action plan in the pharmaceutical sector strategies of several other countries. So I don't want to really carry on about your very illustrious CV, but perhaps you can talk to us about any elements that I might have omitted. So to get us to start off, <coughs> I've said already, the conversation with Stavros said we need to make our essential drugs for ourselves on the continent. What does it take for us to be able to do this? I want you to start off the conversation by saying something a little bit about your work that you think contributes <coughs> to this very noble cause of health security and health self-sufficiency. Um, so a little bit more context and background to myself. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I um, worked in a drug discovery company called Atema Pharmaceuticals, which was largely focused on um, coming up with solutions to neglected diseases in Africa. And during this tenure, I ended up um, being seconded to Professor Steve Lay's group at the University of Cambridge, um, where I got introduced to the concept of some of the concepts surrounding um, continuous manufacturing flow chemistry. Um, <clears throat> and this always struck me as an incredibly interesting and um, technology which had a lot of potential to change the way in which we're doing chemistry. Um, and I subsequently um, came back to South Africa, unfortunately, at Temba Pharmaceuticals. Um, it fell into hard times, if I put it that way, and I transitioned to uh, the University of Pretoria in 2013 and um, through the assistance of uh, the university itself and um, some funding from the GSI, we were able to um, establish a small research group looking at um, the application of flow chemistry as it would, uh, be pertain as it would pertain to manufacturing synthesis of, of organic molecules. Um, fast forward, <coughs> excuse me, 10 years, um, that group has grown quite significantly. We um, received funding from the DSR through the, um, the equipment grant as well as the National Equipment Program. Um, and it's culminated us being able to set up a, a laboratory or facility um, <clears throat> with a lot of cutting edge technology. Um, and today we are heavily involved in um, primarily looking at development of process routes which um, show economic um, sustainability and safety improvements over um, over older technologies um, and over the past five or so years we've successfully developed process routes to six APRs or six, six pharmaceuticals several of which have been transferred over to Genelis, um facility at CSR for translational and upscaling development <clears throat> Um, so we, we, uh, within the group, that's our, our primary uh, research focus, but we also look at a couple of other things. We're interested in aspects of reaction engineering and method development on flow. Um, and we also do quite a bit of work in the space of reactor design, where um, <clears throat> through, the, through the application of um, things such as additive manufacturing and rapid prototyping, we look at the design and testing of uh, novel reactors and bespoke reactors to solve um, uh, various different chemical problems um, and that's something that we, we uh, you know takes up a lot of our time um, and maybe one or two other little things that we're involved in we do have I have a background in drug discovery um, so from a flow perspective we also look at 
the use of flow platforms to expedite um, drug discovery, particularly in the, um, the space of neuroprotective drugs. Okay, so you are into process development and making processes that are efficient, and so your science and your research, your RDI is very, you know, impact driven. It's very directed type of research towards the goals of improving process, the goals of making efficient process and set process. I want to skip you, Jenny Lee, because there is a pattern that I want to establish and speak to what. <laughs> so thanks, Rachel, for the introduction. Also, thanks to Jenny for inviting me today. As was said in the introduction, I began my career in the UK. And this is where you see a difference between different um, systems, where in the UK you've got a large number of chemists doing research in many instances for simply the sake of doing research. Because sadly, not that man much manufacturing is now done in the UK because what's happened over the last 50 years is that they exported most of their manufacturing to China and India. So when I moved to South Africa to take on the Saatchi chair in 2013, the vision was very much to actually do science that would actually make a difference to the economy and to society. And critically, coming from Nelson Mandela University, where the university catchphrase is change the world, it very much fits in with the vision. So in terms of what we are doing, it's very similar to what Darren spoke about, where the research started was on AIDS drugs, and I don't need to explain why AIDS is of such a significance in this country. So I think in the current Department of Health tender, there are currently 14 different APIs used in the triple dose combinations within the country. So far, my group has done some work on seven of those 14 AIDS APIs critically working with one startup company now in South Africa called Mzizi Pharmaceuticals. Some of those are actually starting to actually go into commercialization. Also from a pure academic focus, I've had students look at malaria drugs, TB drugs, diabetes drugs, cancer drugs, things like that. So the vision is certainly once commercial infrastructure is built in South Africa, to enable these drugs to be manufactured, utilizing the innovative technology that Darren spoke about, we've got the recipes and the, and the conditions to actually implement it quickly to actually make a significant difference. I'm very lucky that I hold an NRF Saatchi chair, which gives lots of bursaries to students. So currently I have about 25 students working on these different disease categories to try to develop innovative, more cost-effective processes to hopefully enable us to improve the health of our citizens by producing drugs at lower cost. Typically, 20 or 30 percent cost saving would be ideal. So cost savings. So you're looking at efficient processes that save us costs. Yes. Because cost is indeed a major issue in access. Now, we've heard what the universities are doing in the CSIRs. We are a translational research institute. So Jenny, can you pick up from there? Um, so yes, as, as Rachel's already alluded to, the CSR's focus is really on translational research and development. So where the academic institutions are focused on early stage process development to proof of concept scale, we are focused on bridging um, the gap between academics and proof of concepts all the way into industry and having true proof of concept so that we can cross that innovation chasm. Um, with that in mind, we, um, under the new sign-up strategy, have focused our efforts in the space on the strategic objects of really supporting the use of modern manufacturing technologies to provide a leapfrogging opportunity to the continent, because we believe that South Africa can become a hub for pharmaceutical manufacturing um, and really support continental or wide um, pharmaceutical um, ingredients. Um, so we are focusing on how we can bridge that gap and support both the academics to get their processes to market, but also industry to de-risk their technologies and get them there faster. 
Um, and with that in mind, we are establishing what is called Future Pharma, and I think you, the session is called Future Pharma. Um, and that's effectively an open access facility that will be supporting um, API production. So in my area, which is small molecules chemistry, um, we will be able to go all the way up to pilot scale production of these processes and really show them on a suf sufficient scale to be able to do a proper techno-economic analysis and de-risk investment in facilities, industry facilities that want to actually produce using these new technologies. Um, but in parallel, we have another group that is heavily focused on biopharmaceutical production, which is not the topic of today, but I think after Saros' nice introduction this morning, it's probably important to touch on. And there they're looking at using a range of different um, expression systems to produce biological drugs. So biopharmaceutical drugs, monoclonal antibodies, things like that. Um, and there we have a very strong um, background, probably more than 10 years in the space of working with these types of expression systems. Um, the main one that's linked to Future Pharma currently is the plant-based expression systems and there we are building capacity all the way up to CGMP manufacturing capability um, so that we can have clinical trial um, samples produced at the CSR and market ready samples produced at the CSR to really support industry to enter the market. Thank you very much. Now, Fui, your job is to support that translation pulling research outputs into products for the market. Please speak to us about what you think the contribution coming from yourself is to the cause of that health security <coughs> and health sufficiency. So thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you, everybody, for attending this session. <clears throat> so I'm Vuisila Pani, um, representing the Technology Innovation Agency, which is an agency of uh, the Department of Science and Innovation. Uh, and so we are set up uh, through an act of parliament. And our role really is to um, support innovations coming from high education institutions, science councils, SMEs, inventors. Uh, to take these uh, ideas, inventions through to the market. Uh, ultimately, we you know, pride ourselves in uh, fulfilling a particular role, which is unrivaled in essence in this country, which is the ability to de-risk these innovations. We de-risk them so that uh, they can attract follow-on funding uh, from partners such as the PIC, IDC, whatever it might be, even overseas investors, venture capital, private equity, and so forth, to take these opportunities into the market. And so over the years of his existence as TIA, I mean, we've invested uh, just as the bioeconomy division, which I head up, over a billion rand of taxpayers' monies into these inventions. And so the pressure is on as far as uh, making sure that these inventions get to the market, they're commercialized. And one of the ways we've done this is through the health unit. Some of my colleagues are here from the health unit, uh, where we've invested in uh, what we call the active pharmaceutical ingredients cluster. Uh, and this is a cluster which is housed or hosted by Northwest University. And the purpose of this class is really to look at um, this particular, let's call it market failure, where we have uh, as a country, a, a pharmaceutical industry. However, just under 3% uh, of uh, this, this industry is, is really in the API space. Uh, and that what this means is that most of our APIs uh, are imported. It means now the country's at risk just in terms of supply. So if countries that do supply us with APIs are unable to do so for whatever reason, we're in essence in trouble as far as our pharmaceutical industry is concerned. Um, it also means then that we need to think about our skills. What skills do we have in the country? And what skills do we need to get going such that we can start producing these APIs for ourselves as a country? And so we considered all of these, uh, let's call them uh, challenges, uh, including you know the fact that uh, it's quite expensive just to get going as far as a GMP facility is concerned, the maintenance thereof and so forth. And so what was our role as TR? Let's think uh, about uh, setting this up, this API cluster, which has been set up now. It's going for about two, two and a half years now. Um, and of course, this was not our idea alone. Of course, we had uh, serious discussions with our colleagues, our shareholder, the DSI, in setting this up, because even the DSI recognized that uh, it's critical that we get these skills going in the country. So we're very proud to be part of uh, this sector, the pharmaceutical sector, particularly our you know, contribution through the API cluster. We're certainly looking to develop skills, uh, but ultimately to demonstrate to the world that uh, on the African continent, between this country, we are able to produce world-class APIs. Uh, it means then we're able to tell the world that as a country, uh, we can uh, you know, manufacture these APIs. We can set ourselves up to be in essence contract manufacturers, very much in the same way as India and China have successfully done. Um, and so it sets us up ultimately colleagues uh, for us to be able to offer these technologies through technology packages, licensing, and so forth, to SMEs to participate in this particular space and to, in essence, uh, build our, our economy. So our role is to fund these opportunities. 
we're always looking for more opportunities in this particular space, but ultimately it's about being competitive as a country and as a continent. Thank you very much. I can't summarize what you said because you really cover the whole space from skills to, you know, a focused initiative to ensuring that facilities are availed, but also to ensure that SMMEs get to play in the sector, really trying to break down the structure of the industry so that it's not only the big guys that play in it, but there's also SMMEs that can play in that. Now, you've heard what we are trying to do in that space, as well as what we are trying to do in the public sector to support that translational work, as we as just explained. So, Skumbuzo, from a business perspective, what is that contribution? And then I want you to go a little bit over and say, after what you've heard, what is missing? Why can't we thrive, really? Or is it a question of time? But please talk to us about our business's contribution. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And... Uh... A pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion. Um, maybe just by way of background to add a little bit to what you've said, besides everything that you've mentioned and my work over the last 15 or so years on trying to promote local production and local innovation, um, I, I also sit on the board of uh, BioVec, uh, the local vaccine manufacturer, and I've seen the journey from you know early on until where we are today. I'm one of the founders and a board member of PAPMA, the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, so very close to the action and, and acutely aware of the challenges that we face on the continent, but also the capacity, the significant capacity that we have on the continent that can be utilized to meet our needs if the support is there from governments. And then there are a couple of other roles. I mean, I used to be on the CSIR's uh, Biosciences Research Advisory Panel. I sit on the African Academy of Sciences Clinical Trials Advisory Committee. But the common theme around everything that I've done is about building local capacity, building local capability, and ensuring that you're able to take care of ourselves. If you go and look at some of the work that I've done in the strategies for the likes of Nigeria and Ghana and Ethiopia and whatnot, a common theme in those documents is also the fact that we're exposed as a continent. In fact, we went as far in one of the documents with the USP to almost predict that the pandemic would come that would put us in exactly the position that we are put in. Having said that, let me talk about Kiara and where I see ourselves playing a role. Um, so I run a company called Kiara. We formed the company in 2016. It's a sub-Saharan focused pharmaceutical and medical device company that I co-founded with colleagues. Uh, we all have been working in the South African and African pharma space for the last 25 odd years. Um, from inception, the company was premised on four key pillars. One, innovation, two, quality, three, localization, four, diversification. I want to focus on two when I answer your questions, innovation and localization, because everybody said, you are crazy, follow the old model, import from India, supply, everybody's happy. And for us, it was never an option because it's never been about um, anything but health security. Stavros used two critical words, health security and health sovereignty. We've seen COVID, what COVID has done, and we were very very aware of that and acutely aware of that from the beginning that this is what it has to be about having said that kiara has we as i said we are formed in 2016 we have succeed successfully concluded a number of partnerships exclusive partnerships with companies in the us in europe in south korea um india and um, lately israel and and in all the partnerships that we enter into Tech transfer and local manufacturing is always um, a major component, right? A pivotal moment in our journey came in 2019 when we acquired the manufacturing facility of Novartis, so their generic subsidiary Sandoz. It's an internationally CGMP compliant facility, so we acquired that. We acquired 26 marketing authorizations. We've subsequently added a whole lot of other products. We from that side, we now offer customized services, including contract manufacturing, contract packaging, uh, post-importation testing, and, and stability services for Sandoz. We've got a five-year contract, uh, which is renewable with them. We offer the same service for CIPLA, for Sevia, for Trinity, and there are two other multinationals that we are quite advanced with. 
um, our products uh, in the public sector, in the private sector, and we supply a few other countries in the SADC market. A very exciting um, aspect or part of our journey is on the MedTech side where we've introduced to the market a number of first-in-class technologies, into net care, into live, um, trying to get into government. It takes quite long. But, but crucially in the MedTech space, we are part of a seven-member consortium, six partners based in Europe with the only African party that got European funding to develop a lamb based platform that can be used to diagnose COVID, NTV, and malaria, and influenza. And as part of that journey, we are actually got a tech transfer with a partner. We've got our ISO 13485 certification and we'll be manufacturing that not just for South Africa and Africa, but for the rest of the world markets as well to support our partners. A crucial element in that whole thing is we've also partnered with K-Bio, who's well known to you guys, to develop additional tests. So when you talk about TB and the viral loads and you know tests for RSV and Rhino and whatnot, it will be a South African, largely a South African-led initiative. Of course, we've got other relationship with the CSIR. So my last comment would be, before I go to the next question that you asked, my last question, my, my last comment would be that I've always believed that you've got significant innovation capability in this country. For God's sake, code to fuel here, first start transplant, cities, we can go on and on and on. We just have lacked the funding and the collaborative spirit, I think, to advance some of these things. The question around the value chains that uh, you also asked Stavros at the tail end of the conversation, we always beat around the bush when it comes to this thing. I remember a few years ago running with Paul, trying to get him into various, um, you know, government dams to say, here's a possibility to leapfrog India and do something special. We simply haven't had the leadership to do what needs to be done. Let's be honest. Let's not beat around the bush. It's about leadership. It's about getting real champions to drive this thing. And it's about the faith that it can be done. I tell people all the time, you look at the company, the companies from India that dominate the ARV space. Where did they get the original technologies? I worked for CIPLA for many years. I know CIPLA. The original technologies came from the National Chemical Laboratories. He developed the technologies. He transferred those to the industry at a very nominal cost because there was leadership, there was intention, there was boldness, there was thoughtfulness behind the plans. I don't think our politicians are serious about this thing. And as long as we see health as an expense, as long as you are not willing to champion this thing from the highest offices, we'll forever be begging for other people to help us. It's, it's COVID today. There'll be something else we'll go begging and, you know, again, with our boy begging bow there. So for me, leadership is the critical thing. All these other things we follow, funding, skills, this show leadership and say, we are going to develop this industry. And in order to do that, we are willing to cover side 50% of what the state procures. People will invest. People will come. But show leadership and make... Look at Ethiopia now. We worked on that strategy. Yes, sorry to hold this, but it's been a short <coughs> time. They've, inv they've already attracted over a billion dollars in new investment because the government is deliberate, intentional, and is doing what needs to be done to develop the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, those reflections. And I think they touch on as well something that Stavros highlighted. And the question that I have for you is, I note and I really appreciate the collaborations that you are having with the RDI environment. And I would like to, you to reflect in a minute, just hold the thought, to reflect on the possibilities of something that is coming out of our NSI that might in the near term be on our market something that is homegrown. But while you are reflecting on that, I would like the rest of the colleagues to speak to us about the trends in the technologies that we are seeing. I think a lot of you spoke about you trying to develop efficient, cost-effective end-end technologies. And I would like you to reflect those that want to, I won't call upon, I want you to volunteer. What are the trends in technology? And what of those trends do you think is suitable for our environment? given the challenges that we're speaking about. So technology is the one element, but I think leadership and business sense and so on is something that will also matter and we'll come back to schools on that. 
So I don't know who is volunteering first. Go ahead, Profiling. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I think in terms of, of technology, I think um, it comes as no surprise that, um, in my opinion, in my perspective, the biggest driver currently um, with regards to chemical manufacturing is this um, much talked about move towards continuous manufacturing, which has been underpinned by uh, flow and microfluidic technologies. And I think maybe just for the benefit of, of the audience, um, I'll take 30 seconds just to, to highlight um, what we mean by flow versus some of the older technologies. Um, so for the past 100, 150 years, um, the chemical industry has been stuck um, manufacturing in what we call a batch manufacturing environment. So if we wanted to produce a particular pharmaceutical, um, we would do it in a batch by batch manner. And although this technology has been very well refined over this period of time, um, by virtue of the fact that you're doing it in a batch by batch manner, it suffers um, certain intrinsic um, issues and difficulties. And furthermore, it is a technology that starts to fall apart as we start to try to scale these processes up. So we tend to find ourselves limited. If we want to produce something, we have to make it in a whole series of small batches. Um, in contrast, um, a flow of microfluidics allows one to perform reactions in continual flowing streams on um, re microfluidic ba uh, based reactors, which have a significantly smaller volume, but can be run in a continuous manner. And it gives, us, gives, gives one much better control of the reaction conditions. And um, within reason, I would say it, it is a, 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 a much easier technology to scale up. And very quickly, when you start adopting this technology, you start to get to a point where you can outperform um, some of the older batch based technologies. That being said, it's not the, the only solution and it's not gonna solve every chemical synthesis problem. And looking to the future, I don't believe you ever, you, well, not, not at, the, at this, the current state of technology, you're not going to get to a point where all of a sudden on one day, everything's gonna be made under continuous flow conditions. I think there's still gonna be a need for batch. And I think one of the big trends now is the hybridization of batch and flow technologies into single platforms um, of technology. Um, and, and maybe one additional thing that I can add that I think is a growing trend, certainly within the field, is now the move towards highly automated systems and highly automated synthesis, both at an R&D level and also at a manufacturing level. Uh, I think it's no longer sufficient to, to run uh, processes with, which requires significant amounts of manual intervention. I think uh, we're moving into the, or we're in the midst of the, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and as part of that, I think we, we had a couple of talks, nice talks on this uh, yesterday. Um, chemical manufacturing is moving in the same direction. Um, we want to be able to integrate smart devices, integrate things like the, chem the, the internet of things, the internet of chemical things. Um, and moving forward, I envisage, um, you know, a smart, a smart plant, a smart manufacturing um, hub where we've integrated aspects of robotics and artificial intelligence, machine learning, not only to expedite the, uh, the development of processes, but also to expedite them or, or to facilitate the management of, of processes um, and allow us to, um, you know, allow us to monitor processes on the fly and adjust processes um, on the fly, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've hogged this conversation and I just wondered if um, colleagues, you can start to think about your questions. I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask before I come back to you, Skumbuza, to ask certain things, because what you say, I think we we'll need to pull together the conversation because ultimately you are at the end of this value chain and it's important that you pull all the inputs together. So on that note, colleagues, start thinking about your questions. And Jenny, can you add? And then ever so briefly, so that we don't uh, end the session without having heard from our audience. So, so I think um, Darren's already introduced the, the concepts or the trends in the space quite nicely. I think from our perspective, you know, we, as the CSR, the other trends maybe that we have, that you've touched on, but haven't elaborated on, are really the integration of, um, integrated analytics and i think from this perspective it's really important in an african context and we've seen this in the news a lot recently where we have low quality drugs entering our markets or counterfeit drugs entering our markets and i think 
one of the trends that's coming through is the integration of process analytical technologies and this ability to be able to use these new technologies to have continual oversight of quality and to make sure that we really have quality medicines for our people at an affordable price. And I think that's really important from our perspective. Thank you very much. So analytics, okay. Paul? One very quick comment, which is Stumbuzu has been political, so I can be political. <laughs> during... And then I shall be fired. <laughs> during, <laughs> during COVID, Donald Trump wanted America to make drugs. Yes, he wanted them to make drugs to improve the health of society, but he also wanted to stop trade with China. What technology did he invest in? He invested in continuous manufacturing. He gave one company called Continuous Pharma, which is a spin out of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, 70 million US dollars to manufacture three drugs and a spin out of Virginia Commonwealth University. He actually gave in one go 354 million US dollars to start local drug manufacturing. Why flow? Darren is absolutely spot on. Is it the golden bullet that's going to solve every single problem? No, it's not. But is it well established that it can make a huge, significant advancement? Yes, it is, because it links to the previous comment that I made that typically you can make 20% cost savings, which potentially means that 20% extra patients can be treated with exactly the same investment. So please, government, give us that sort of funding and it will go even further than it went in America to actually establish local drug manufacturing. Our challenge, however, is the Asians have worked out what's going on. So one challenge is that you, what we are going to probably see is that their prices can start dropping as well. So we, we have to bear in mind the challenges, but I think it could really help. Thank you very much. So really you hear about the amounts of money that are required <laughs> to get us going. So, or, you know, it, it gives one food for thought. But quick reflections on your part before I give the audience a chance, please. Do leave room. Yeah. So, so indeed, um, <clears throat> when we've looked at the value chain, you know, within the country, we do realize and recognize that uh, there are pockets of expertise uh, and uh, building blocks, let's call it that, as far as the pharma industry is concerned. And our role as tier, of course, would be to understand, uh, you know, these, uh, these pockets of excellence to understand uh, where the gaps are and to fill those particular gaps. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things that we've picked up is that um, you can never have enough uh, of participants and players in the market. So it gives us a great joy when we see colleagues such as the CSR, we see you know, expertise coming up at the universities, people get into this particular space. And actually, um, you know, adopting modern technologies uh, we're quite often criticized, you know, as, 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 as a country, as a continent to say that we are often, uh, you know, the or takers or adopters of late technologies when the rest of the world has done these kinds of things. So it gives me great pleasure, you know, to hear programs such as next generating technologies at the CSR for argument's sake um, and, you know, NMU, for example, in flow chemistry and so forth, uh, because these are in essence the technologies that we should be investing in as a country. It means then that I need to be uh, very nice to my uh, shareholder, uh, the TSI, just in terms of um, getting them on board in terms of the large investments that need uh, you know, to be done in these institutions. Um, particularly, I think I mentioned the, the, the setup of pilot facilities. You know, we need more of these pilot facilities. They're expensive. They might be at a, at, must be at a certain standard, GMP standards. But what that means, as I said earlier on, is that it shows the world that we can do these kinds of things. And we are, in essence, a hub. Uh, for this this type of technology so certainly my support uh, you have that thank you very much i was thinking what about consolidation so that you do a few things and do a few things well but that's a discussion for another time Absolutely. so um colleagues do you have any questions before i ask Skubuso to pull together um, the end of the value chain conversation given what you see us trying to do in the rds space 
Thank you. I'll stand so you can see me. Uh, my name is Rose Hayeshi. I'm the director of the preclinical drug development platform at Northwest University. So um, this morning we heard about health security and we've talked about local innovation, homegrown technologies, and I'd like to focus on the drug development value chain. And we sit there between discovery and the clinical. And um, I'd like your opinion, and I think Prof. Um, Riley spoke about that they do some drug discovery. So I'd like to hear your opinion on um, the where are we going or will we get to a point in terms of the R&D where we develop our own molecules that can be taken from the bench to the bedside. Um, and then this would then require the strengthening of the preclinical ecosystem because where we sit, we feel that, that we need to strengthen the preclinical ecosystem. However, we need the drug discovery um, researchers or we need more in terms of the pipeline of molecules coming from the drug discovery space through us and then we pass it on to the clinical space. So I'd like to hear your opinion on whether we are at a stage where we can actually start from the beginning and take a molecule all the way through. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we've got very few minutes left. One more question. I don't see any other questions. So can you respond please kindly? So I think before I let the academic partners jump in here, um, I think there's one point that you, you need to consider in the local ecosystem, and, and they're probably not represented here today, but it's the excellent work that's being done at H3D under the leadership of Prof. Shivali. And I think they are really a beacon of hope in terms of how we can do drug discovery in this country and how through very strong partnerships with international players and a very focused um, itinerary in terms of what they, they're dealing with. So they're not trying to do everything, but they're trying to do a few things very, very well. And I think they've really made excellent partnerships in terms of drug discovery um, with international players in the space, but also in terms of leveraging and transferring skills into the continent. So I think from my perspective, I think there's, there's definitely a lot we are doing in the drug discovery space. Um, and yes, we, we need to be able to bring our own molecules through through the pipeline and, and all the way to the markets. But what I think the facility that we're building um, will assist with in the, in the short term is that we can really use these facilities, these open access facilities, to prepare clinical trial grade materials. So when we get to the point where we have drugs that need to go into clinical trials, as long as we have GMP accredited um, facilities that can produce small batches of materials, we can actually start moving things that are homegrown or that are international um, drugs that we want to test in the country using our, our existing clinical trials network um, through the production process, through our actual um, GMP production facilities. So I think that's one step that we're taking in that, in that challenge <laughs> to at least try and address. Thank you very much. And colleagues, the next thing that we need to do is, I think, take a, I think there is a break at, at about 10.50, a little bit of a break. So if we can just take a few more minutes to just complete our conversation. So Skumbuzo, I, I asked you what you think of all this and when we can likely expect things that are coming from the system through all these efforts to go through uh, your platforms and others' platforms to see homemade products. It's it's a very difficult question yeah, to tackle. Um, I, I think let's start with uh, the collaborations first. Let's start with the way we approach things. Do we have a common vision? Do you have a collective vision to say this is where we need to go? I I think back to a few years I was involved in the evaluation of uh, <clears throat> the CSI's um, TB nano drug platform. It was a fantastic platform. I mean, the guy we, we did the evaluation with, one of the international guys, uh, Rogerio Gaspar, who's now at WHO, had been involved in bringing the first nano drug to the world market. And when that program was shut down, he, he could not believe it. He says, your country has the possibility to take a leading position and develop a platform that can be used to deliver drugs in cancer, in this and that. We shut it down, right? <laughs> part of the reason was obviously the funding gap. Um, part of the reason was we don't have the same philosophy, the same vision. Um, part of the reason was there was no industry partner willing to jump in and say, there'd been some interest, I think, from Novartis, but maybe from a malaria perspective. So I think we need to get the environment and the ecosystem right. We need at some point as South Africans to get into the same room and say, what is our vision for this industry? What is our vision for what we want to see 
our health care go? Are we going to be perpetual recipients? Are we going to use the, the significant expertise that we have? It might be in pockets, but it's significant, right? As we had around the, 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 the variants and we've seen what Cape Bio has done and people like Tsepo in their units. And, you know, you guys are doing excellent work in the universities, in the research centers. Let's bring it together and 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 really try and and sing from the same beam sheet and 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 drive the same vision, right? I think that is crucial. The second important point now, coming from an industry perspective, we're a small player. We are not an Aspen. If we had more resources, whatever, we'd be doing a lot more because we know what is possible. That's what makes it so crucially important for us to get their support from a procurement perspective because at least if you know i'm guaranteed sufficient cash flows i'll generate the revenues is that you're able to take a punt and say 10 or 15 percent of my profits i'm going to if you believe in innovation like we do and and we've got sufficient examples around from around the world south korea for example one of our partners who ended up developing a completely new molecule it cost them 50 million from the lab to the clinic. So the story about $1 billion, this, that, it scares us before we even start. We need to craft our own reality within our own limitations, collaborate and see how we can take this thing forward. And I can guarantee you, industry will be willing to come to the party, but it also means that when you guys do these things, you don't have to look towards Novartis first, whatever, involve the local players, see what you can do with them. And lastly, I think that political support, without that, you cannot go anywhere. We really cannot go anywhere. Maybe uh, to Rose's comment, just the last point, National Institutes of Pharmaceutical Research and Development in Nigeria developed Nutrisa, one of the first, one of the, the new, it was a new drug in the treatment of sickle cell disease. It was developed in Nigeria. It was a less than for less than $10 million, they took that drug. Hemisphere Corporation in the U.S. bought the right sister. It's not as expensive as we think. Mm -hmm. We need to have the faith that it can be done. We need to have the confidence to start. We need to have the confidence to start. Uh, I think I'll post it. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there's any last-minute comments, colleagues, or has it all been said? We. So thanks very much, Kambusa. I mean, I must um, agree with what you're saying. I think for us as well, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients cluster, you know, one of the milestones we said that uh, we said was think about uh, partnerships. So I cannot overemphasize the need for partnerships, uh, both locally and international. So in that particular case, for example, you know, uh, the, the, the cluster has managed to get the interest of people such as the Gates Foundation, Medicines for Raw, uh, Medicines Patent Pool, World Health Organization, the Clinton Health um, uh, Access Initiative, and so forth. Um, and this has really in assisted the cluster to be able to attract this uh, international attention. It means then we can now start looking at uh, ways to approach funders that will, in essence, fund the next steps of this. Now, just to also address Rose, you know, Rose, I think what you're saying is very important. I really appreciate you bringing these kinds of uh, questions to us as well. Because what it means is that, you know, you know, as a country, as a continent, we should be thinking about the entire value chain and how we capture that value chain uh, in the positive sense um, and, and to make to make good of it. Um, and I think, you know, one cannot, uh, you know, sort of overlook the contribution made by uh, indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, some of those chemicals coming from plants are really things we need to be looking at uh, to use the facilities we have in the country to take these drugs forward into the market so that we can have the examples uh, you know shared by skumbus around uh, the, the, the nigerian success story so thank you very much for that thank you very much colleagues and uh, any last minute things from you i think it's all been said so colleagues help me to congratulate and thank our panelists for an interesting discussion and let's remember collaboration and let's also remember some consolidation in terms of putting our money in such a manner that we build critical capability and not be too fragmented. So for me, it's about collaboration and it's about building critical mass so that we can actually achieve something, not giving everybody their own little piece, but saying, can we have one vision? I think I heard the word of the common vision from you, Skumbuza. So on that note, please allow me to thank our colleagues.